lectures do not miss its session, landmark papers in neuro-oncology. Uh, may I request uh, the chairpersons to please come up on the stage. Dr. Purvish Parekh, uh, he's the professor and head department of uh, clinical hematology, uh, MGMCH Jaipur, Mumbai. Dr. Bipin Valia, principal director and head of neurosurgery, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Saket. And Professor Dr. Ryo Nishikawa, he's the secretary general, Asian Society for Neurooncology. Chair, Department of Neuro-Oncology and Neurosurgery, Saitama Medical University, Japan. He is joining us virtually. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nishikawa, for joining us online and being our chairperson. As the Secretary General of the Asian Society of Neuro-Oncology, we look forward to a lot of direction and interaction with you. And especially thank you from on behalf of Dr. Rakesh Jalali as well. Uh, I now request the chairpersons to please invite the speakers for the talk. Thank you. The first one is by Dr. Rupesh Koteja. Uh, thank. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is he on live or recorded? Okay. Dr. Rupesh Koteja is from Miami Cancer Institute, Baptist Health, USA. And his uh, talk is Proton CSI and Leptomeningeal Metastasis in Solid Tumors, Making Lives Better with Invisible Scar. Can you start the video, please? Well, thank you, thank you for having me here today uh, to discuss virtually this topic, which is of uh, increasing relevance now to us in the neuro-oncology community. The topic title is Proton CSI, craniospinal radiation in leptomeningeal metastasis in solid tumors, making lives better with an invisible scalpel. My name is Rupesh Kritecha. I'm a radiation oncologist in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Miami Cancer Institute in Florida. These are my disclosures of specific note. I work very closely with Dr. Jonathan Yang, um, who is um, really creative in the area of proton CSI for solid tumor leptomeningeal metastasis. So initially, when we're thinking about treatment options for patients with brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease, essentially, whether you categorize patients by the extent of their disease or maybe even by their performance status, by their extent of extracranial disease, for their volume or number of intracranial metastases, you would come right into categories of patients, those who have unfavorable features and those who have more favorable features. Essentially, the treatment used to be the same for all of these patients, standard or typical whole brain radiation therapy. In the modern era though, we have a variety of new treatment options and the flavor of different options available for each patient's um, are different based on all of these individual features. And they can range from the right here, systemic therapy alone for patients who are well-selected, have very uh, limited intracranial disease burden or asymptomatic, potentially stereotactic radiosurgery, the second panel for patients who have limited intracranial metastatic disease, but more macroscopic or larger intracranial volume. For those who have miliary disease, we still offer traditional whole brain radiation therapy. And then finally, the topic of today's discussion is going to be the innovation of the use of craniospinal radiation in patients with leptomeningeal disease. So we're going to focus on the very left-hand side of the screen. Now, as a really background, leptomeningeal disease involves infiltration of tumor cells into the leptomeninges of the brain and the spinal cord, as well as the cerebral spinal fluid. This occurs in about 2 to 12% of our patients who have concurrent brain metastasis. So it's something to definitely look out for with the location of lesions, maybe with the patient's tumor status, um, whether they're superficial in nature, whether there are other concerning radiographic imaging findings. It is part of the clinical course for a significant portion of our patients, anywhere from 1% to 30%, 37%. And this also depends on the histology, with some histologies more frequently associated with leptomeningeal disease. It can lead to death within four to six weeks without treatment or four to six months with our standard therapies. In addition to this issue, it is associated with considerable neurologic morbidity in that patients can have headaches, nausea, cranial nerve deficits, seizures, sensory loss, weakness, gait abnormalities, or incontinence, 
And these symptoms can be due to the primary disease extent itself or be associated with the hydrocephalus that results from leptomeningeal disease. Now the standard of care photon therapies are involved field radiation therapy. So that is typically whole brain radiation therapy, um, but we can also add focal spine radiotherapy for patients who have symptomatic areas. Now this is effective for relieving symptoms, but does not halt the progression of disease along the leptomeningeal space or the CNS axis. Our current NCCN guidelines, at least in the United States, um, recommend risk stratifying patients based on performance status, but the goal of radiotherapy is really to alleviate symptoms and not improve survival of our patients. These are the NCCN guidelines, most recent version, uh, one from 2022. As you can see, the treatment approach here is essentially in all field radiation therapy. Again, this is based on level 2A evidence or less. Now, although an entire compartment approach to the management of leptomeningeal disease is preferred, the reason why those NCCN guidelines exist is that our photon radiotherapy technology is limited by the treatment-related toxicities that occur. This is not unsurprising when you look at the dosimetric um, uh, graphs, essentially comparing all the different photon therapy modalities. So if you look at the ice dose distribution for, for example, 3D conformal radiotherapy, IMRT, VMAT, and then TOMO, you can see that there's some advantages to certain techniques versus another, especially in the setting of VMAT versus TOMO therapy. But if you compare all of these photon technologies versus proton therapy, especially pencil beam scanning proton therapy, you can see that there's a significant difference in that isodose distribution. And to date, um, the photon therapy studies have been, occurred with significant toxicities. These are all retrospective reports. Uh, essentially, this is the entire literature, just five studies. You can see the median doses. Typically, you can't use the hypofractionated schedules that we use for other palliative sites, um, given the long length of the field and potential toxicity from this. So patients receive long courses of radiation, 20 fractions potentially, and that's a long period of time for a patient who has a very limited survival. And you can see here the grade three or higher toxicities. Um, there's one study that did not report significant high grade toxicities. We won't discuss that too much in detail. And again, not all those patients completed their therapy, but there are other studies that show very high grade toxicities in this patient population. And if you look at comparative studies between photon CSI and proton CSI outside of the leptomeningeal space, we know that there are dosimetric differences and those end up translating into reduction in treatment related toxicities to those nearby organs at risk. Depicted here is a very nice uh, retrospective comparative analysis performed at MD Anderson Cancer Center in which patients uh, received either photon or proton craniospinal radiation. You can see that the patients who had more weight loss, it was 64% for photons versus 16% for protons. And then we're looking at both the nadir and one month after toxicity hematologic uh, effects of radiation. There are differences with regards to white blood cells, hemoglobin, and platelets with proton therapy versus photon therapy. Outside of these traditional uh, toxicities, photon CSI was also associated with higher grade two or higher nausea and vomiting, as well as grade three or higher esophagitis. And these rates are very significantly different between these two. For example, esophagitis rate is essentially 10 times higher with photon therapy than with proton therapy. So this led to an early proton CSI evaluation, as I mentioned by Dr. Jonathan Yang at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which was a phase 1B study of proton craniospinal radiation for patients with solid tumor leptomeningeal metastasis. 21 patients were accrued during essentially this year-long study, and all patients received 30 gray in 10 fractions. I would note, though, that this study actually did allow for a dose reduction if there was high-grade toxicities, but this was never encountered. In fact, the investigators saw limited high-grade treatment-related toxicities, <clears throat> as you can see here on the table on the right, for grade 3 and grade 4 toxicities. And they also saw promising disease control outcomes. It was not just that this treatment was safe itself, is that there was um, interesting disease control outcomes that were longer than what we had previously seen in the literature. For example, the median CNS PFS was seven months. The median OS is nine months. And the last patient was actually censored at 24 months. This is significantly different than what we'd expect with um, traditional approaches and based on the NCC guidelines where the survival is anywhere from four to six months. 
So this interesting outcome led to a phase two randomized study. This is for patients with solid tumor leptomeningeal metastasis. Patients had an MRI of the brain, total spine, as well as a lumbar puncture prior to entry. Um, there were essentially two cohorts of patients accrued. We won't talk about that second cohort, which was patients with other solid tumor histologies. That's an exploratory cohort in this study. But for patients with non-small cell lung cancer and breast cancer, who account for the majority of patients diagnosed with leptomeningeal disease, they were stratified by their histology and their systemic disease status. And they were randomized in a two-to-one ratio, favoring proton craniospinal radiation to either proton craniospinal radiation or involved field radiation therapy, which can include whole brain radiation therapy with or without palliative radiation therapy to a symptomatic spinal segment. Patients were then followed with MRI of the brain, total spine, and lumbar puncture. So again, we're going to focus on just this cohort over here today. So again, the primary objective of the study was to compare that CNS PFS of proton craniospinal radiation versus photon involved field radiation therapy, again, in those two cohorts of patients. There were a number of secondary objectives, including to compare the overall survival between these two treatment strategies, as well as to characterize the treatment-related adverse events associated with that. Including criteria-wise, um, this study included patients with leptomeningeal disease diagnosed radiographically and or with CSF cytology, but I would consider high-sensitivity screening tests as these patients were enrolled at a very specific cancer center where they used um, high-resolution CSF cytology evaluation, and they did have that positive, as well as a KPS of at least 60, so it's careful to, you should be careful in evaluating patients' performance status and their ability to receive therapy. So this is um, a more favorable leptomeningeal patient population. Inclusion criteria included multiple serious major neurologic deficits, including encephalopathy, as well as extensive systemic disease without any reasonable systemic treatment options. It's important to note with the primary endpoint of central nervous system progression-free survival, but what did it actually mean? So that was defined as one of the three following criteria. Number one, clinical, any new neurologic deficit. Two, radiographic, any progressive disease using a specific leptomeningeal assessment in neuro-oncology scale. And three, cytologic, any new positive cytology in patients who had previously negative cytology. Now, essentially over a year and a half, 108 patients were assessed for eligibility, and 63 non-small cell lung cancer and breast cancer patients were randomized, 42 to the experimental arm and 21 to the control arm. And of note, 35 patients with solid tumor histologies were also enrolled into the exploratory cohort. Now, when we look at the results of this, which were recently published in JCO, essentially a majority of the patients were female, had non-small cell lung cancer, had um, stable, uh, sorry, had active uh, systemic disease, um, and did have brain metastasis. There was an interim analysis that was actually performed by the institutional DSMC, and that was performed at a median follow-up of 9.3 months in the study. Um, patients who are randomized to the proton craniospinal radiation uh, arm, um, only 12 of the patients actually um, had CNS progression, 16 patients had died, eight with systemic progression, four with CNS progression, and four with CNS and systemic progression. If you look at the patients who were randomized to the involved field radiation therapy arm, again, 21 patients, you have 16 patients now who had CNS progression, and 14 patients had actually died, nine of whom had CNS progression, and five had CNS and systemic disease progression. I'll give you the raw numbers here, but I think if you focus on the kaplan meier curves with regards to the probability of CNS progression, you see a substantial difference between photon-involved field radiation therapy. Essentially, at six months, you have about 75% of patients um, or higher failing, versus if you look at the proton CSI arm, this is less than 25% of patients. Now, when we look further at the data, again, the primary endpoint for this study was CNS PFS, and this was statistically significantly different and also substantially significantly different. This is a clinical difference. It was 7.5 months with proton CSI versus 2.3 months with photon and ball field radiation therapy. The last point is actually probably the most surprising is this did translate into a overall survival benefit for patients. The median survival in the proton arm was 9.9 months versus 6.0 months with photon-involved field radiation therapy. So although this was not power for overall survival, it was not the primary endpoint, this key secondary endpoint was positive in this study. And I would say is a, essentially a four-month delta 
the survival we would expect with photon and molecular radiation therapy alone. When we're thinking about the toxicities from this, this table actually includes the patients randomized to the proton CSI, photon involved field radiation therapy, as well as the exploratory proton CSI. When you pull all the patients with regards to toxicities, there wasn't any significant high-grade toxicities specifically um, related to uh, proton CSI. So this is well tolerated overall. We're thinking about the multivariate analysis for survival for these patients. Um, Proton CSI was key, as well as patients who had stable or non-systemic disease. So I think uh, making sure that patients have active treatment um, so that they can stabilize their systemic disease is key to survival for these patients. So how have we translated these findings at our cancer center in Miami? Well, essentially, this is our workflow that we have been revised since we had the results from this study. Patients who are diagnosed or are suspected to have leptomeningeal disease complete their workup with an MRI of the brain, MRI of the spine. Also, aging studies of the body are performed to help dictate systemic therapy regimens and ability to receive systemic therapy. As well as we perform a high-resolution CSF evaluation, and we also evaluate the molecular profile of the CSF as there could be some discordance with the primary disease. And you can see the types of charts that we we're able to obtain. Then uh, patients are triaged into two pathways. The first pathway is symptom management alone. These patients have poor performance status uh, and potentially uh, go straight to hospice or receive palliative photon and ball field radiation therapy to symptomatic sites. Essentially would probably transition to hospice afterwards. For those patients who we think um, meet the criteria for active treatment for their systemic therapy, we actually enroll them into an ongoing neurocognitive registry available at our institution as well as then offer them proton CSI, 30 gray in 10 fractions. You can see the proton plan for a patient that I recently completed their treatment for last week. With regards to follow-up, uh, we obtain MRIs of the brain, MRIs of the spine, as well as repeat CSF evaluation. And then over time, you can see, for example, in this chart here, uh, with regards to CSF tumor cells uh, per milliliter per time, um, hopefully you can see a reduction. Um, this is a patient for us as well. So this is what we are currently evaluating in our workflow. Now with regards to further directions, there is an NRG confirmatory trial, BN2225. The PI for this study is uh, Dr. Jonathan Yang, and I'm the radiation oncology chair. Now, based on these practice changing results from the phase two study with regards to CNS PFS, this is a design that is currently in process as a confirmatory phase three trial, which is appropriately powered for the overall survival benefit. We'll include patients with similar enrollment criteria to the pre previous studies. There are more stratification criteria such as histology, systemic disease status, as well as immunotherapy and or target therapy or intrafecal therapy within four weeks. Patients are randomized in a two to one ratio to proton CSI versus photon and ball field radiation therapy. So this has been submitted to the NRG research strategy and is then undergoing further discussion. Last, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. I'm sorry that this uh, meeting uh, occurs concurrently with the uh, SNOW Brain Mets meeting. Um, so if there are any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me via email um, sorry, I cannot be there. And I hope in the future that we can see everyone at uh, in-person meetings in the future um, instead of the Zoom conferences that we have uh, gotten accustomed to over the last two years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rupesh. Uh, uh, before we move to the next speaker, I should apologize to Dr. Nishikawa. I wrongly introduced him as Secretary General. Actually, he is President of the Asian Society, Neuro-Oncology Society. Sir, we will take your concluding remarks when at the end of all the four presentations, if you don't mind. Question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rupesh. Uh, this is Tejpan here. Rupesh is not online. Not Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. May I call upon the next speaker, my dear friend, Dr. Nitesh Rodhi. He is a senior medical oncologist, actually a celebrity medical oncologist <laughs> from New Delhi. And his topic is the ASCO abstracts, darbafenib, trematinib in low-grade glioma's the ROAR study. Thank you very much, sir. My disclaimer, I'm not a celebrity oncologist. I mean, just actually very much <laughs> as much of a colleague as anyone else. 
So I think this was very interesting. Uh, I think we've all had some experience and I would like to take anybody's open mic experience on the combination uh, of using the com of dabrafenib and uh, trametinib in BRAF mutant patient. I've certainly had three of my own patients and it was nice to see a study which was designed around a very specific target with a specific combination of drugs. Although I do, I think we most of us know about the basket trial, which Dr. Subaya has started from MD Anderson, where they picked up different mutations and then classified it into different tumor types, including biliary tumors, anaplast anaplastic thyroid tumors, and brain tumors. But coming to BRAF V600E, it is a very strong and independent, as in there are not many other uh, uh, significant mutations that run on the other pathways with it. It's a very uh, significant driver oncogenic mutation. In primary CNS tumor, BRAF V600 is uh, uh, frequently found in xanthrocytochroma. Uh, uh, ganglioglyomas uh, uh, and pilocytic astrocytomas and epithelioid uh, uh, glioblastomas. In fact, Dr. Jalali was the first one to point this out three years ago that there's a patient with epithelioid glioblastoma do a BRAF. And in fact, that patient was BRAF, the patient common who goes to Chennai from, from the army background and was BRAF and we successfully treated with a combination of dabrafenib and maybe and and trametinib for over now she's failing at about 18 months so the uh, dabrafenib vemirafenib uh, is demonstrated to have clinical activity but we do know and i'll just show a cartoon later that the mech which is, sits below that creates a resistance and a bypass that's why you need to combine it with a mech inhibitor which is trametinib in this case the resistance to braf inhibitors occurs through reactivation of that pathway which i just said and combining this therefore makes a lot of logical sense. And as we've seen that in melanomas, in fact, we've seen a little bit in the lung cancer already, and we are now seeing it in other cancers. It has not yet, it had not yet been established whether the addition of MEC uh, with uh, these drugs actually was effective in, in CNS tumors. So that laid the foundation of the ROAR study, which was, as I said, a basket trial. So we picked up all these tumors and they picked up a mutation and there's similar icon for many other, uh, this is almost, I think, a decade long project which will carry on. And in WHO grade one, grade two tumors versus grade three, grade four tumors, we, we classified them as low grade gliomas and high grade uh, and gave them a, a combination of dabrafenib at 150 twice a day and tremendous 2 mgod which at least in our experience seems to be well tolerated across tumor types. You do get some bit of rash and acne and fever and that gets manageable and sometimes those reductions are required. In this study, they gave the treatment till disease progression, death or unacceptable toxicity. But the primary endpoint was investigator assessed response rate or ORR, the secondary being PFSOS safety and very important duration of response. And I do think Duration of response in this tumor type as compared to a lung or pancreas or breast is very relevant because we have seen that it is the volume of disease increase or sometimes necrosis which causes the biggest comorbidity in these patients. So this is, as I said, just a very short uh, uh, kind of focus diagram, which is very important to remember when you're thinking of BRAF inhibitors, that with the pathway itself, uh, when mutated, uh, is, is hemostatic and when allowed to proliferate causes a lot of survival, invasion, metastasis. And you have to block both, both the, the BRAF V6 and the MEC below. Uh, otherwise, there is uh, uh, it kind of goes around the RAS pathways and you can still get a stimulation. And that's why it gets very important to block both. And we've seen that in various tumors. In fact, melanoma was the first one where we saw that, that despite of so many V600, the, the uh, single drug did not do extremely well. So this was a, a multi-center trial across 13 countries across about four years. Uh, 45 patients, 31 with uh, glioblastoma were enrolled with high-grade cohort, and there were 13 persons with low-grade cohort. I personally have not done a mutation and I'll testing in low-grade cohort, and maybe one should. And we gave the dabrafenib at 150 twice and 2 mg once. Uh, I think a point missed in the last slide was that about 3% of population 
is expected to have BRAF uh, uh, V600 mutation. That's not a small number, especially for the GBM world. So this was a subgroup analysis of, of the grade and age. Uh, we can see that the, the high grade tumors uh, had a significant uh, uh, objective response rate of 30 to 31%. The duration of response in grade three tumors at 12 months was 100%. And that's again for a GBM world, a very big number that at one year, um, all patients in grade three and actually three fourths almost patients in grade uh, four tumors were uh, uh, responding to, to disease. My own three patients, one was 18, one is sitting at actually 20, the other one actually progressed at four months. I don't know whether that was uh, for uh, any other reason, a second mutation or not. Uh, the PFS by investigation was 12 versus 16.4 months and the OS is, is very interesting, is 196 weeks versus 82 weeks. And this has been commented on uh, in, in the editorial where they said that it's very strange that the PFS is 16 weeks and, and the uh, OS is 196 weeks and 12 weeks and 82 because, I mean, most of us know that PFS is almost coinciding with the OS in brain tumors. You know, the, the disease becomes lethal or critical as it progresses. So this was the, the low-grade cohort of the ROAR study, which, which showed a complete response in one patient. And remember, they were only 13, but again, it's very difficult to do uh, studies in, in these groups. So 13 is small, but not small enough. But there was complete response in one patient, which is not bad. There was a partial response in six out of 13 patients. So 50% patients, more than 50% actually had a complete or partial response. That's a big number for the low-grade glioma group also. Because these are groups which remain static, but they don't really go away until they change and then we see progression. The stable disease was seen in another 15% patients and progressive disease in the remaining. So all in all, we saw that almost close to 75-80% patient had a clinical benefit in that group with some complete responses. So I think that was quite interesting. Looking at low-grade glioma as a whole, the median follow-up was 32 months, objective response rate seen in about 70% patients, complete response in one, so that makes it about uh, 80. Additional three patients had stable disease. Median duration of response has not reached. It was ranging from 5.5 months to not reached. The median progression free survival has not reached and the median overall survival has not reached. So I think that was a, again, you could say this is a small number, but this was path breaking in the sense that if you can find this mutation, you can actually attack it with a drug, which is both available in India and deliverable. In the high grade glioma cohort also, the median follow up was 12.7 months, about a year. Response rate was uh, uh, 15, which is 33% or 45 a complete response in seeing additional 22% patients and the median duration of response was 36 months. That again is uh, quite interesting in the brain tumor world. The median PFS was 3.8 months and the overall survival 17.6 months. So there's some discrepancy. I don't think there's a clear explanation of why that happened, but it could be, there could be one of two things. Either the fact that you managed to control it um, kind of motivated the team to retreat them. We know that when patients come back after one year versus less than one year, the tumor board tends to look at them differently. Or it could be that uh, uh, the drug itself made it amenable to the next line of therapy, maybe at Iodotican or Avastin. So I'll cut short. Grade three adverse effect were mostly fatigue, neutrophil count low, headache, neutropenia. Um, the grade serious adverse effect was seizures, vomiting, headache, and nausea. I do find that acne and fever, and especially fever with trametinib, is a very important uh, symptom, which at least was not captured in this, but my, my own experience that has been shown all three patients of brain tumor and the other three, four of other tumors as well. Um, so FDA has given accelerated approval to dabrafenib in combination to metinib for unselected or metastatic solid tumors with V600, and brain tumor is certainly a part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nitesh. Uh, can we request Dr. Nishikawa to give his comments on the first two presentations, please? Proton CSI as well as the road study. 
Sir, over to you. Uh, can I ask you a question to uh, Dr. Nitesh Rohalki? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very great uh, presentation, but I still have a tiny question. Uh, I remember the overall response rate in lower grade glioma included uh, stable disease or minor disease. Okay. If you limit the overall response rate to CR and PR, I remember uh, the response rate is about 50% even in tumors with a BRAF mutation. So my question is, why only 50%? So is I there any kind of alternative way or something I, like that? I, I think to my mind, uh, Prof, uh, we have to look at obviously low-grade glioma and uh, more mitotic, high-grade gliomas differently. And in our experience, at least in your experience, is a lot more low-grade gliomas stick around, don't change at all for months and years together till they change biology and start actually growing. So I think in the in terms of the follow-up of up to about a year, year and a half, uh, you would not expect a very big change in either ways. To expect a less mitotic tumor to decrease in size significantly to the point of complete response, to my mind, would be a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, remember, BRAF uh, inhibitors are not anti-mitotic. They, they are cytostatic in some ways. Mm. Thank you very much. This one question. Yeah. Very nice, Nitesh. I think one of the reasons between the PFS and OS, I'm just thinking, could it also be an imaging problem? Mm. Because PFS is determined mainly by the radiological imaging. So, uh, I mean, I have few patients also on the same combination. So whether there is any flare or like we see in other cases, so which have been misinterpreted. So when I when I look back at our three patients, including the one who progressed very rapidly, the edema part was not so much. In fact, the the this the patient who progressed rapidly, his perfusion went up on scan one, and the scan two we saw actually volume increase. So the epithelioid one as well as the anaplastic reaxis ones can bleed. Yeah, the yeah. first epithelioid one bled. The, the lady we are talking and about, she bled. Five, six epithelioid GBMs. One of them is doing very well. Yeah. She's 2016 case. Okay. I presented in the morning talk okay. and she's still doing well. She's two and a half years on the dual inhibitor and doing well. But um, so when you have a bleed, it's very difficult to even see the perfusion because that it can That may be the case. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just yeah. wondering aloud yeah. whether there's a central radiology. The question actually I want to ask you though is which is very common in our practice, I'm sure you as well, because of the cost and logistics. Some people say do we really need to take both the drugs. Can we draw yes. one drug? No. So for, for example, the beta fusion, you tend to give inhibitor, But if it's just a V6 mutation, why do you need remetinib? I, I I am actually very clear minded about this across tumor side that MEC inhibition is very critical to the uh, vemurafenib or dabarafenib working because we have seen that the escape mechanisms are very easy. In fact, when you look at some very basic science studies, uh, including some work from Cellworks in, in, in San Francisco, you see there is a clear amplification of all the pathways. So I think the combination is a must. I am not entirely sure if the combination and the full dose is a must, but I do think combination was the, the patient who did best was actually the only patient I have a GBM with extra cranial metastasis. He had a bone disease come out and then he had multiple bone meds and, and there was affordability question. So there were times when we uh, tried uh, to remove one drug uh, and it didn't work. And then we gave lower doses of both drugs and kept remetinib high and it actually worked very well for another six months. So I do think that trametinib, in fact, has a bigger role. Of course, it won't work without BRAF inhibition. So I think the combination is a must. One very small point. I think I agree with you. The patient who is doing well is also a combination. Sometimes, actually, Dr. Burkhari had a very nice patient we presented yesterday, where we gave a drug holiday yeah, because yeah. of, again, yeah. and the tumor just came back so quickly. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they're they're very proliferative in that respect, the high-grade ones. So I think we'll have to be careful about that. So it's three and a half lakh rupees a month. I think you can get it cheaper. Uh, thankfully, the first patient, the one who had extra cranial, we managed on compassionate use for 
the first eight to 10 months. Um, I, I think it would be wrong of me to say that try to cut the cost down by lowering the dose down. Uh, but I think if the patient does achieve an ex excellent response, some level of experimentation won't be incorrect, but not to begin with. Thank you, Nitesh. Okay, thank you, sir. Wonderful. Can we now move on? Dr. Priya Tiwari. She is going to talk on what everybody wants to hear, and that is the role of immunotherapy in glioma's uncover the real me. Dr. Priya Tiwari is senior consultant, uh, medical oncology and hematology at Artemis Hospital. Hello, hello, sir. So happy Independence Day, everybody! It's nice to see celebrations everywhere. Uh, a very important topic and a very relevant one especially because uh, this is the field of brain tumor. We actually don't have much options, especially for high-grade gliomas. But unfortunately, the pace with which the immunotherapy is picked up in various other extracranial tumors, um, we are not there yet for intracranial tumors. So to start with, yes, we need more. Why? Because of the long-term dismal outcomes, especially for the high-grade gliomas. And most of the research is actually revolving around the high-grade glioma itself. We have very few immunotherapy studies for the low-grade gliomas. So this is, a, uh, this is a slide to show you that what all immunotherapy uh, modalities are there in the research as of now. So you have adoptive T-cell therapies, CAR T-cell therapies, and lymphoma is doing remarkable results. We have talk of the town called as the checkpoint blockade therapy, the CTL4 pathway inhibitors, as well as, well as the PD1, PDL1 inhibitors. And uh, that is where the most of the research is actually revolving, even for the brain tumors. We have cytokine therapies, macrophage activation pathways, NK cell therapies, oncolytic virus therapies, which are actually showing promising results. We have early phases trials for uh, the certain brain tumors, and where we are seeing that, yes, the remissions are possible. And yes, vaccines are also there. So uh, the combinations are being, uh, being used and also we are getting newer options day by day. So many of them are being tried in the gliomas also, especially the immune checkpoint blockade. So both CTL4 pathway inhibitors as well as PD1, PDL1 inhibitors pathway, they come in the immune checkpoint uh, uh, blockade. Uh, uh, besides that, as I previously said, we have oncolytic virus, then we have vaccines also, and CAR T cell uh, based research also going on. However, the challenges persist. As I previously said, that for the brain tumors, we have yet not been able to find that kind of results as we have been able to find for the other kinds of, especially for the extracranial tumors or for the extracranial tumors having intracranial metastasis. Why? Because we see a lot of barriers. Uh, now, what is important is that if you want an immunotherapy to work, it's very important that you see the immune signature. If it is loaded with the inflammatory cells, the T lymphocytes, and a lack of uh, immunosuppressive cells, we know that the immunotherapy is going to work. Now, somehow in the brain tumors, these kinds of signatures are missing. We have a lot of immunosuppressive myeloid cells, and we see very few immunotherapy-promoting kind of T lymphocytes there. So this is a problem with most of uh, the brain tumors. And also the most of the research is trying to find out that if these immune cold uh, tumors can be converted into immune hot tumors, that is where the which can increase the responses of immunotherapies, that is the way to go forward. So yes, the first and the important research is about the PDL1, PDL1 pathways. So the tumor cells will express certain ligands which will bind to certain receptors on the T lymphocytes and they will cause the inhibition of tumor specific immunity. This is the basis of these kind of tumor specific inhibition and then the tumor will propagate uh, without any resistance. So if you can block this pathway by many various drugs, that is, that is the way to achieve tumor killing. So where we have the role of now PDL1 blockers. So the preclinical studies for brain tumors and high-grain gliomas actually showed very promising results. And that is why we had this study, Checkmate 143 cohort 2. So 369 patients, first recurrence of GBM, they were stratified 1 is to 1. Nivolumab 3 milligram per kg 2 weekly was given and compared to the standard bevacizumab, which we usually commonly use 10 milligram 2, 2 weekly. Overall survival was the primary endpoint. However, as far as the overall survival rates were not different, they were not favoring 
nivolumab. And when you see the PFS, you actually just see 1.5 months of median PFS in the nivolumab arm, which is actually very low. And this was just being discussed previously that uh, when you see such kind of low PFS, you will also, uh, of course, uh, question the radiology. And th there are very important question comes, how do you actually monitor or assess the response when the patients are on immunotherapy drugs? So very dismal PFS figures here, and that brought uh, that brings us to a very important topic that the immunotherapy response assessment in neuro-oncology. Now, whenever you start a patient on immunotherapy, we always expect that there could be a lot of inflammatory changes. There could be like coming in of the, of the inflammatory cells. So you might see an actually pseudo progression kind of figure. And that is why it's very important that you just don't label your findings. You need to see it in detail. You need to see the clinical, uh, clinical worsening or deterioration. And you need to do sometimes the repeat imaging also to be certain that yes, there is true progression or not. So that is why where the from the rhino criteria we have now the immune rhino criteria also. And that is also true for the extracranial tumors also. So coming back to the study, now, as, as I previously said, that not major differences in the terms of survival figures. So nivolumab, not doing great here. But yes, a slight, a very slight, tiny, tiny signal in the MG methylated group and also patients who have not received any steroids. So we all understand that the steroids are immunosuppressants and that might be also one of the reasons that the immunotherapies are not doing well because most of our brain tumor patients are on steroids for a very long duration, isn't it? So when, when the patients are not taking steroids, maybe that is the group of patients, or maybe you need to taper down your steroids um, rapidly to gain, to show some kind of responses. Because here it was seen that the patient who had not taken the dexamethasone, actually the, the, the nivolumab did better. And that was also concluded in the accompanying editorial of this article. But the two factors associated with improved median survival were MGMT methylated patients with no baseline steroid use, experience tends towards improved survival. That was nivolumab 17 months versus bevacizumab 10.1 months, suggesting patients with methylated MGMT promoter GBM and no baseline corticosteroids may potentially derive benefit from immune checkpoint inhibition. So yes, we need to use our drugs judiciously. So what about combination of immunotherapy with radiation? We see that the, if you do radiation, it might cause cell killing, it can increase antigenic expression. If you have more antigens, you will have more immune cells. So actually this will be acting as synergistic with the immunotherapy. So yes, there are preclinical studies which have shown this synergism. The only downside is that sometimes there's a caveat that it, there could be slightly lymphopenic action of radiation therapy. However, this, there were two very important studies based on this premise, Checkmate 498, nivolumab or temozolomide. So we are comparing nivolumab, but it's an immune checkpoint inhibitor with temozolomide in MGMT unmethylated population. For MGMT unmethylated population, we still don't know, we don't have a clarity on the standard of care as far as the systemic therapy is concerned. We do know about the MGMT methylated drugs, but not for the MGMT methylated. So this was in combination with radiation therapy in newly diagnosed patient with MGMT unmethylated GBM. Checkmate 498 trial. We had another Checkmate 548 trial, nivolumab or placebo in combination with radiation plus temozolomide in newly diagnosed patient with MGMT methylated or indeterminate. So we have a standard radiation plus temozolomide and we see nivolumab in arm arm and placebo in the other arm. So Checkmate 498, patients were randomized one is to one, patients were given um, nivolumab, temozolomide, primary endpoint was overall survival, 560 patients and randomized to 80 patients, but again, no major differences. Median overall survival, 13.4 months with nivo RT versus 14.9 months in the temozolomide RT arm. And no differences in the PFS response rates. Again, no, nothing favored nivolumab here. And grade three, four events, you already understand how nivolumab behaves. We understand the toxicities and no new safety signal was seen. So nivolumab is not a suitable substitute for temozolomide in this group of patients, and so the search is on. So what about Checkmate 548, where we are actually adding nivolumab to the temozolomide plus radiation. So 716 patients, one is to one randomization. A primary endpoint was PFN, and always in patients without baseline corticosteroids and in all randomized patients. But again, we don't see much hope here as well. Median PFS, 10.6 months versus 10.3 months. Median overall survival, 28.9 months versus 32.1 months. And again, in patients without baseline corticosteroids, though we were hoping that maybe this is a group where immunotherapy should work well. This was again, not where we did huge differences. So yes, now this is a very important study. So we are also trying to find out where we can actually push in immunotherapy to find the maximum responses. So sometimes when you are giving treating patients and when you have when you have a disease coming back, at that time patient might have a lot of disease. So it is expected or hoped that patient might have a lot of antigens there. So maybe the new adjuvant therapy before a planned surgery might be one group of patients where you can actually try giving 
immunotherapy and maybe you are having a response. So this was the premise of this particular study. Pembrolizumab was the immunotherapy drug which was tried here. Neoadjuvant anti-PD-1 immunotherapy promotes a survival benefit with intratremor and the systemic immune response in recurrent glioblastoma. It was a very small study. Okay, but what you can see by the graph that it did help, they give pembrolizumab single dose 200 milligram two weeks before the expected date of surgery. So there was no uh, delay in the um, surgery dates because of the immunotherapy. And there were no, de uh, there were no differences in the surgical resection rates or ultimate the surgical outcome. But they did find that yes, it did impact overall survival in a positive manner with 418 days favoring the um, new adjuvant pembrolizumab up compared to 226 amp. So they give one dose of immunotherapy before surgery, then it was continued after surgery till the time of progression. And the other arm was that you just continue adjuvant immunotherapy till progression. Uh, importantly, they excluded the patient who had taken DEXA more than four milligram from this particular trial. So new adjuvant PD-1 monoclonal antibody blockade induces functional activation of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. They were also able to study the changes they were happening in the tumor because of this immunotherapy. And they did find that yes, the immune mediated um, mechanisms are upregulated and that favors the immunotherapy responses. So a, a very brief about oncolytic virus. Uh, polio virus and the HSV viruses are the two viruses which have now shown promising results. Uh, this is how the mechanism works. Oncolytic polio virus, you find a receptor by which it can actually go inside the cell. You find non-replicating variants. And when they go inside the cells, there is tumor cell that release of tumor antigens. And these tumor antigens will stimulate body's immunity, ultimately role of antigen presenting cells, and ultimately immune mediated tumor killing. So this was what was done to a very good publication from NEGM, recurrent glioblastoma treated with recombinant polio virus in the adults patients. A replication defective polio virus was injected in direct, directly into the recurrent glioblastoma tumors. And dexamethasone and bevacizumab were also used to give it to edema. Now you can see from the graph that you have long-term sustained responses. A total of 20% of the treatment patients have survived beyond three years. So the authors concluded intratumoral infusion of such and such polio virus in recurrent WHO grade 4 malignant glioma confirmed the absence of non-virulent potential. The toxicity is what that we usually see. However, there were, um, there were one intracranial hemorrhage. The survival rate among patients who received immunotherapy were higher at 24 and 36 months than the rate among historical countries. So this is just one of the um, uh, patients. So you see the second, uh, uh, this uh, MRI image. So you see slightly enlargement of the lesion. How much time do I have? It's all gone. Can I continue, sir? Five more minutes? One minute more, okay. So slightly enlargement of the lesion. And um, that again tells you that there might be some kind of uh, not true progression, but ultimately there were results. So yes, and on pulling HSV, this was a pediatric study, high-grade glioma. A neurotropic herpes virus that was genetically inactivated to prevent replication in normal cells was injected into the brain tumors of 12 patients with tumors. Again, very small study that had progressed during previous treatment. 11 patients had some radiographic or clinical responses with inflammation detected in scans. The median survival was 12.2 months and four of the 11 patients were still alive 18 months after the treatment. So what was important here is that uh, they also saw that the cold tumors were being converted into hot tumors. That was, by, that was what you can see by the IHC, the three months, nine months, the duration written, the progressive infiltration of the cells, immune cells. So the intratumoral G207 alone and in with radiation had an acceptable, acceptable adverse event profile with evidence of responses in patients with recurrent or progressive pediatric high-grade glioma, and it converts cold tumors to hot one. So just to conclude, we need to find right biomarker, right timing, right combination, but yes, immunotherapy has a promising role in these tumors. So we are not there yet, but yes, the journey has begun. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we move to the last speaker for this session, Dr. Pawan Goel. He's senior consultant neurosurgeon at Artemis Hospital, and he's going to talk about ERAS care pathway. How can we enhance the recovery after surgery? Dr. Pawan Goel, please. Uh, uh, very good morning, respected chairpersons and audience. So I will be discussing regarding the application of ERAS care pathway in neurosurgical practices. So ERAS stands for enhanced recovery after surgery. A good and compassionate 
care, uh, pro uh, providing a good and compassionate care to their uh, uh, patients is the ultimate goal for all the healthcare professionals. So IRAS is just a step towards achieving that aim. This is a multidiscipline, multimodal, integrated approach in patient care, and it aims to improve quality of surgical care by not discovering new knowledge, but by integrating what we already know in a streamlined fashion to provide better care to their patients. Historically speaking, the IRAS pathway was introduced back in 1990 by Henrik Kellett, along with various European surgeons and anesthesiologists. And the society was created in 2001. The first consensus protocol was published in 2005. The society was initially created for uh, implementation in colorectal surgeries, but its horizon was further widened uh, and uh, fields like subspecialties like urology, ops and gynae and spine surgeries were also included. So as I, say, as I said, the IRAS is a collection of evidence-based perioperative practices designed to reduce surgical stress, maintain normal physiological function, enhance early functional recovery of the patients, decrease healthcare costs, and improve overall patient satisfaction. This pathway is based on six core principles applicable to all surgeries, that is patient engagement, nutrition, mobility, perioperative fluid management, pain relief, and inclusion of best practices. These are the key components of IRAS protocol, broadly divided into three sections, pre-operative, intra-operative, and post-operative. Each section I will discuss briefly in my further slides. Now, as I said, the IRAS protocol is well established in various subspecialties, but for neurosurgery, uh, this is a relatively new concept. But the implementation of such protocols is very important for neurosurgical practices because if the perioperative care is not proper, then the chances of increase in morbidity and mortality can be exponentially high. So there is a need for delicate, well-balanced protocol to make a significant difference in patient outcome. As such, there is a paucity of literature regarding implementation of IRAS protocols in neurosurgery. This study by Wong et al. is at, uh, as pre at present the best study available regarding the implementation of IRAS protocol in elective craniotomies. And it concludes that IRAS protocol for elective craniotomy appears to be, have a significant benefit over conventional perioperative management. It is safe. It reduces uh, post-operative hospital stay significantly, accelerates mm -hmm. the recovery, and there is no increase in the complication rates. Now coming to IRAS in gliomas. The feasibility and safety of IRAS protocol has already been established, as I mentioned in my slides, previous slides. However, there is paucity of literature on IRAS protocols for various individual neurological diseases like gliomas. This is actually the first real-world study of implementation of IRAS protocol in glioma patients undergoing elective craniotomies. Glioma, as we know, is, a, uh, is the most frequent primary malignant brain tumor in adults. And despite significant advances in treatment in the form of surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, etc., the prognosis still remains poor. So this study was aimed towards assessing the clinical efficacy and safety of IRAS protocol in glioma surgeries uh, in the patients undergoing elective craniotomy. These are the inclusion criteria. 18 to 65 years of age patients were included with a KPS score of more than 70 and the lesion should be restricted to less than three lobes. The study spanned over a period of uh, one and a half year from September 19 to May 21. It was a randomized uh, clinical trial which compared the conventional care to the IRAS protocol group. The primary outcome was the post-operative hospital length of stay and there uh, were secondary outcomes like 30-day readmission rates, post-op complications, duration of drainage tube, time to first oral intake, time to ambulation, and functional recovery status. These were the key measures included in the IRAS protocol for glioma patients. So this table is showing the comparative outcomes in both the groups, the IRAS and control groups, and it concludes that the total hospital length of stay and post-operative hospital length of stay was significantly shorter in the IRAS group as compared to the control group. The total cost of hospitalization was also less, although it was not statistically significant, uh, but it was less in the IRAS group. Other measures like time of first oral intake, early catheter removal, and early ambulation were also 
significantly shorter in the ERAS group. The functional recovery and the reduction in anxiety and depression were similar in both the groups. So this is the workflow of ERAS protocol for gliomas and it is broadly divided into three sections, pre-operative, intraoperative and post-operative. And I will be discussing briefly uh, each component of the uh, section in my uh, further slides. Uh, educating the patient regarding details of surgery and anesthesia procedures is very important because it not only allays fear and anxiety in the patient, but also it improves post-op recovery and quickens hospital discharge and impacts our overall outcome of the patient in a positive manner. Apart from that, abstinence from smoking and alcohol is also important. It helps to reduce pulmonary complications, wound healing complications, and also decreases morbidity and mortality in the post-op period. Uh, Four-week abstinence is recommended to have a better outcome. Next is the nutrition. Poor nutrition can lead to prolonged hospital stay and increase in the morbidity. Nowadays, the focus is more on immunonutrition, which contains arginine, glutamine, and omega-3 fatty acids, uh, because it helps patient tolerate oxidative stress in a better manner. Shortened pre-op fasting time and carbohydrate loading of the patients up to two hours prior to surgery is also very helpful because it decreases insulin resistance and improves the subjective feelings of hunger, thirst, and post-operative fatigue in a patient as compared to the patient who is fasting for a longer time. The chronotype patient, patients are at a high risk of developing DVT. The mechanical prophylaxis is preferred over pharmacological prophylaxis because of the inherent risk of bleeding in chronotomies with the use of pharmacological agents. A perioperative antibiotic prophylaxis not only reduces skin infection, surgical site infections, but also helps to reduce the incidence of meningitis. An adult dose of cifazolin within one hour prior to incision is recommended as antimicrobial prophylaxis. The scalp infiltrations and block help in a better control of hemodynamic and stress responses. It decreases opioid consumption and statistically significantly lowers the pain uh, sensation on the first post of day. A rapid recovery from anesthesia is also uh, very important to have a early hospital discharge. However, there is uh, evidence is not supportive of any particular anesthesia. Uh, uh, the total IV anesthesia and inhalational anesthesia are both considered to be equally good. Uh, however, there is strong recommendation against ketamine, lidocaine, nitrous oxide uh, because of the uh, side effects associated with them like hallucinations, sedations, post-operative nausea vomiting is also increased with the use of these agents. Awake chronotomy is considered to be better if the tumor is located in eloquent areas. The post-operative nausea and vomiting can be very distressing for the patients and uh, it has a high incidence of 47%. It may lead to increase in intracranial pressure and increased risk of intracranial bleedings. So uh, its management is very important. A routine use of serotonin receptor antagonists like condensatron and dexamethasone is recommended for all chronotomy patients. Management of uh, uh, maintaining core body temperature is also very important because hypothermia can lead to increased risk of wound infections, coagulopathy, prolonged anesthesia recovery, and cardiac morbidities. Minimally invasive surgical approaches are attractive options both for patients and for the surgeons because it improves self-perception for the patient. It helps early return to work, reduces post op pain, and also uh, parallels the ability to start adjuvant therapy, chemotherapy earlier. Judicial maintenance of fluid balance is also important to meet the dual goals of good operative field exposure and hemodynamic stability and to decrease the length of stay, cost, and post-operative complications. There are certain other measures like early catheter removal, early start of post-op nutrition, and early mobilization, which help to uh, help in early recovery of the functional capacity of the patient. And rigorous audit of the compliance is also important to ensure that success of or failure is due to the protocol and not due to the unrecognized co-founders. So in this study, the compliance was strictly followed and more than 80% compliance was ensured, which led to good outcome in ERAS protocol in this study, which I mentioned. The recommendations of ERAS society are based on evidence and recommendations. There are certain points like counseling, carbohydrate loading, 
minimal invasive approaches and fluid balances for which evidences are low but still they are recommended by the panel because they are expected to give better uh, desirable outcomes as compared to undesirable outcomes so there are certain criteria like technique for scalp blocks non opiate alternatives and improve outcomes with minimally invasive surgeries which are a little different in the new surgical practices as compared to the traditional iras concept the salient features of this study were this is the first real world study describing the iras protocol for gliomas this is particularly beneficial for glioma patients it is specifically amended to include mental and psychological changes for glioma patients and the compliance was strictly tracked for all the iras measures which lead, led to better overall results there are certain limitations like this was not a properly randomized study and it was a single center study a multi center high volume study is needed to give a better uh, assessment regarding the feasibility of uh, iras protocol in general practice and uh, in all uh, primary uh, in uh, applying of this practice in care at all levels so what we are uh, we are using many of the measures of these protocols at our center like we use navigation guided minimally invasive approaches to make craniotomies as small as possible we do pre operative counseling of our patients regarding the risk and benefits the scalp block antibiotic prophylaxis anesthesia protocols uh, nausea vomiting prophylaxis and avoiding hypothermia are taken care of by our anesthesia colleagues we try to mobilize the patient as early as possible and uh, the catheter removal is done by a video is not ready this is the page uh, slide of uh, this is a small video of our patient being mobilized on the first post operative day the catheter removal was done within 24 hours and uh, we take care of dvt prophylaxis also however i must say that uh, we are not following a strict iras protocol our uh, measures are basically uh, are have do have a high variability which is understandable in neurosurgery patients because there is a lot of heterogeneity in pathological process and there is a risk involved in in uh, in using iras practices in neurosurgery patients so a lot of prospective trials are needed to provide higher level evidence and as i know as we know iras protocol is a team work so close collaboration among neurosurgeons anesthesiologists and intensivists is needed to develop and implement iras strategies thank you thank you very much dr pawan can we ask uh, for expert comments from dr nishikawa please Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, 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 let Let's start from the beginning. And the The first talk was about the proton beam CSI, uh, which is wonderful, no doubt. But I still have a couple of questions. Uh, about one is about the demand and supply. We do have a high demand for uh, for proton beam CSI, but uh, but do we have enough number of proton beam fa fa machines? Uh, in the world on and the second question is about the cost of effectiveness for such a poor prognostic disease the second talk was about a the target therapy uh, which is also wonderful and very promising uh, but still we have to ask if there is any any resistance pathway uh, and this is a very interesting field and the third talk was a nice review of the immunotherapy for glioma, which was really a wonderful review. And the last talk was uh, ERAS. ERAS is quite new to me and quite uh, informative. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So, so congratulations for a great success of the Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology meeting. And thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Nishikawa. With this, we come to the end of this session and I hand over back to the organizer.